every team has offensive schemes. Like Phil Jackson had the triangle, right? Yeah. And so he said, here's a triangle. Here's a system. This is where you line up. But this only works with your creativity that you bring to the system. Mm. So you have to create the actual framework and then let people roam. Like you can't tell Michael Jordan like where to dribble and like yeah. where to bounce the. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can't tell yeah. him that. But you could say, "Hey, could you line up over here?" And then like, <laughs> and like, didn't you can just do your thing? Yeah. And so it's yeah. A, it's the same thing I think when it comes to like strategy and working with creative is like giving them like a little bit of the box and the details of like as long as you guys are coming up with things that are like within this space or working in the right territory how it manifests, how it comes to life, that's not really in my hands. Hey, my name's Alicia Harris, and this is The Invisible Thread, culture's biggest show where we finally put a spotlight on strategy, highlighting how the world's biggest brands and people become who they are and the strategic minds behind them. I have a very special guest in the building today, Jeff McHenry, Group Strategy Director at Translation. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good, thank you very much for having yeah, me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So the first part of our conversation is really just tapping into you, okay. right? So can you kind of just walk us through the beginning of your story and who you are and how you made your entry into strategy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally from the Bay Area. Um, and when I was a kid, I used to always visit my aunt um, in New York, kind of like yeah. during the winter time. And one year when I went to go visit her, I was walking down the street and I saw this issue of Vibe magazine, and it had Dr. Dre and Eminem on the cover. Yeah. And it was uh, the Juice issue. Like, you ever heard okay, of the yep. Juice issue before? And so what was cool about it is that I always loved music, but it was the first time that I was ever able to see there could be opportunities for, like, all the people who are behind the scenes, the A&Rs, the label execs, et cetera. And so for me, I actually always wanted to work in the music industry. So when I first went to Morehouse, um, I was a political science major and I was studying poli sci because I was like, the way I'm going to get into the music industry, I'm going to be an entertainment yeah, yeah. Be entertainment lawyer. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and then I looked at the LSAT and I was no longer a poli sci major. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, that's a quick no. <laughs> and that's, when, uh, that's actually when I got into marketing. And so I basically was trying to figure out what's another way that I could use like tools of persuasion in like a creative way. And I kind of got into marketing. But in terms of finding strategy, I didn't really understand that until I went over to Ogilvy and I was fortunate enough to get into their associates program. So I rotated through four different parts of advertising, but I had no idea what any of these positions were. So yeah. I didn't know what account management was or strategy or creative, but I was fortunate enough to be able to rotate through some of those different departments. And so I ultimately ended up in account management, but I always just had a passion for strategy because I was just so interested in people and psychology and human behavior. And I wanted to tap more into that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of kind of how I first got the bug into it. And so was there any moment like within the associates program where you were working on a brand or for a specific client, et cetera, that really made you understand the totality of strategy and like want to actually move forward within it? Interestingly enough, I think for me, it was actually when I went over to translation is when I really, really got to get a firm understanding. I think one of the great things that I had when I was at Ogilvy is I did a rotation in entertainment and I did a rotation in strategy. And those were the two things that I really wanted to do. Yeah. When I went over to translation, I was able to kind of merge those two things together, right? So I was able, and I actually kind of started where I was working what was known as our music department at the time. Okay. And within that department, I was doing experiential production. And then I was also doing like a lot of like music partnership strategy. So I made mm -hmm. a lot of Venn diagrams. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's <laughs> it sounds like, like good. Yeah. you know, it's like <laughs> the artist values are this, brand yeah. values are this, the opportunity is this, you yeah. know, that kind of yeah. thing. And it was fantastic because it really allowed me to start getting into, well, there's a way that I can merge my passion for things like music and things like sports, but then tap into it through the lens of strategy and really use that to shape where a brand should be yeah. going. And that's what I learned at Translation. Yeah. Why music, sports, and like the whole world of entertainment? Like I know you were like into it, but were there any like key figures or songs or people that like got you deeper into wanting to actually make a career out of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I grew up an athlete. I grew up playing, I mean, playing basketball since I was like five years old. So yeah. a huge Golden State Warriors fan because I'm from the Bay mm -hmm. Area. And so 
sports has been a part of my life like from the very day I was born and same thing with music. And the interesting thing when we talk about music and sports in the intersection is that my fondest memory of sports like were actually directly tied to music. So when I would go to different tournaments and I would be in the car with my mom, my mom is playing like Jill Scott, mm -hmm. Erica Badu, Baduism, like my dad's playing like Celine Dion and like, like just yeah. Luther Vandross. And so yeah. I would have all these memories that were sports memories, but mm -hmm. music was directly tied to all of those things. It was the vehicle for a lot of those memories. And so I just knew that all those things needed to exist together and then being able to do it through the lens of strategy has been truly amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. I always, whenever I'm having conversations with people trying to figure out like which part of marketing they wanna get into or even if they wanna get into marketing, just confusion, right? Yeah. I always just say, start with your interests. Yeah. You know, the reason I moved over from like a traditional agency landscape to where I am now was simply because I kept listening to J. Cole's album, yeah. like <laughs> on repeat, like the off season, like I didn't stop. Totally. And then I went to the tour and I was buying the merch and I just fell in love with, of course, like him and the music and the production and all of that, but just like the whole world that yeah. him and his team has created. And I was like, I want to be a part of that. You know, Absolutely. I want to go serve that. Like, yeah. that's what gets me. And so, like, that's why I made the shift deeper into entertainment. And I just, you know, recapping on that, I just always tell people, start with what you're interested in, truly interested in. Because yeah. there's a way that you can actually make a career out of it. You just have to be strategic in finding which right door to open to Absolutely. do so. So we talked a little bit about finding strategy, but now let's shift into actually doing it, okay. right? And so today you're gonna be highlighting a specific cam campaign that you worked on for Sprite. Yep. Um, but let's just start at the beginning of like the brand of Sprite and its role in culture and kind of move from there. Yeah, for sure. First off, I love Sprite, okay? Yeah. Like Sprite Same. was one of the very first brands to embrace hip hop culture, going all the way back from like having Curtis Blow in a commercial, all the way to the work that they were doing with like having Nas and AZ on the mm -hmm. stoop. And like Sprite is so synonymous with culture that like everyone still to this day calls it the Sprite slam dunk contest. And mm -hmm. I <laughs> sponsored yeah. that thing for years. It's just, <laughs> it's a part of the culture, you yeah. know? And so, I just always grew up just being like such a huge fan of the brand, which is why I was really, really excited to be able to, you know, have an opportunity to work on it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so what was the challenge that you guys were facing when it came to like the reason why this campaign even needed to be restarted or made? Yeah, 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 yeah. So interestingly enough, I know I look very young, but I'm a little bit on the older side. Oh, but gosh. I like my connection to the Sprite brand is very strong because literally from the year I was born, like Sprite was doing tons of stuff within hip hop culture. But I would say the challenge is how Sprite as a brand was connecting with the next generation of hip hop creators, right? So they had to figure out, they had all this lineage, they had all this brand equity, and Noah can challenge the contributions that they made to the culture holistically. But now when you have this whole new generation who's being introduced to hip hop and being introduced to the culture, what does Sprite mean to them? Mm. And that was the thing that we had to solve. Yeah, and so how did you start digging deeper into that? Like figuring out like, what does the brand mean to these people? Like specifically from a strategic perspective, was it like interviews? Was it another form of research? Yeah, it was a few different things. So I think the first thing that we did was we kind of took a step back and we we're just thinking about like, well, this is about connecting with the next generation of hip hop. What does hip hop represent today? And that mm -hmm. was really kind of like the main thing that drove the insight that we landed on where hip hop was, always been an art form for self-expression. It's always been an art form for people to have their voices their voices heard. But now we're in a place where hip hop is a culture that represents endless possibilities. You think about hip hop and how it relates to every single facet of culture, right? Yeah. From sports to fashion, all the way to the White House. Like this is around the same time we're working on this campaign where like Kendrick Lamar had just won a Pulitzer. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Where Lil Nas X was like completely defying like the roles of like genre and gender yeah. and all those things of that nature. Jay-Z had become like the first billionaire, like Cardi B was like on this whole political run mm -hmm. with her conversations. And so it was everywhere. Yeah. And so we had to figure out like, okay, well, if that's what hip hop represents today, how can we use that to connect to the next generation of hip hop creators? And so to your point around research, what we actually ended up doing is after we came up with that insight and kind of that overall thought, 
we got a whole bunch of young black creators and we actually used them as kind of like, I wouldn't even call it a focus group. They were very much active contributors to yeah. the campaign. So we went in and we showed them, here's kind of like the TV script and what we're thinking about saying in that. Here's the out of home boards. What do you guys think about that? Here's like a brand action we're thinking about doing. What do you all think about that? And we got live feedback from like young black creators around the ages of like 18 to their early 20s who are exactly the audience that we we're looking to reach yeah. and that way we knew the things that we were doing were going to resonate with yeah them. for sure and like even digging into what you're saying about like bringing other people in into the creative process yeah i think there's so many different ways we could take that but like one starting as a strategist when you are already a part of a specific culture or community that a brand is trying to talk to i think sometimes it's easy to think like oh i know what the solve is yeah you know what i mean like oh <laughs> totally. this is me like you know you're giving the brief as if you are their persona because you are right yeah. but being black or a part of any other community there's so many different nuances to it and you don't represent the totality of that you know yeah. so it's always so important to like bring in other creators into that process with you but even if we took a step back and looked at how agencies typically do that with ERGs now, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes it can be a little problematic or like an issue when you're just like using an ERG, whether it's an Asian community or black community, et cetera, as kind of just like a sounding board. Like we've already created this yeah. work. And yeah. did we say any words that could be offensive or is this like not the best image <laughs> right. versus instead of just using them as the sounding board, actually using them as creatives, like in yeah. the process to build it with you. Because if mm -hmm. you start from that, point you have a stronger foundation yeah you know so like just taking that concept as far as like ergs and bringing them into the different conversations or just like creatives in general across your, your your agency whether they're the erg or not like how do you think is the best you know way to do so to bring yeah. more people into the process versus just using them at the end yeah yeah i love that you brought up that point because it's not about testing for whether something's going to be offensive it's more about is this idea gonna resonate with the audience that it's targeted for? And that's where I find the disconnect happens, right? So like people are only focusing on it through the lens of like, well, we don't wanna offend or we don't wanna say anything wrong when in reality, you should be testing whether the work is going to matter to the people that you're trying to reach, yeah. right? And so getting people involved in early stages of the process to be able to look at scripts, to be able to look at ideas and really everything comes down to nuance. And so you have to be able to like get into those level of details and it could be the small thing about like what the clothing that someone's wearing or the dialect in terms of how they speak or yeah. all those things matter. And so I think sometimes our industry has a tendency to like brush a lot of those things off where it's like, oh, we'll, we'll fix that in post. So like we'll yeah. fix it in the edit. And it's like, yeah. no, we have to get those details together now because those are the things that are really gonna drive like that level of relevance. like. I can't tell you how many times, even with at translation, we did the spot for Beats by Dre about you love me. And yeah. the things that resonated the most was like seeing like the baby hairs. Absolutely. Laid, you yeah. know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the stuff that resonates. And so those details are always very important to have to be worked out early in the creative process. Yeah, for sure. And so how do you take that strategy that we just spoke about as far as like Sprite needing to reconnect with a different generation? And, you know, all these different things are happening in culture with Cardi B and Kendrick, et cetera, and relay that to a creative team in a way that's actually interesting. And I say yeah, that because it's yeah. easy to just put a picture of Cardi B up there and a picture of Kendrick, et cetera, um, throughout your brief. But like, how do you go about whether it's this campaign or just like others that you've been a, a part of yeah. actually making a creative team excited to want to work on the work, especially when they're not really a part of the culture that you are yeah. speaking to sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think the key thing is, and I actually was gonna talk about this later, but I think it's a good point to talk about it now, is like strategy to me is all about telling the truth, but telling it with a slant. So you're always trying to find like, what's the spin, what's the provocative way into like not make something up, yeah. <laughs> but to like say yeah. the thing that we know to universally be true and tell it in an interesting and dynamic way. And in this case, it's like, there's a truth about this culture and there's this truth about this brand this culture that represents endless possibilities. And when you think of endless possibilities, you equate that to what? Dreams. Like mm. you just think of like all the stuff that you could dream up, all the possibilities that are out there. 
And now hip hop has become a culture for dreamers, mm. like people who just have big ideas and big thoughts, and like they actually think those things are possible now. Yeah. And so I think that's the thing that we really wanted to focus on was that level of optimism, the level of dreaming, and being able to bring that to life through the work in a really interesting and dynamic way. So what are some of the creative assets that flowed from that, from that train of thought? Absolutely. So we started, um, so the platform we created was called Thirst for Yours. And really what that was about was like allowing our audience and inspiring them to kind of do more and dream bigger and really built on that sort of insight around the culture that represents endless possibilities. So mm -hmm. to the point around dreams, we started with a spot where we had uh, Cody Shane, who is an up and coming hip, hip hop artist. We had Seth Giscombe, who was a student at Clark Atlanta, but was also a designer yeah. um, as well. And we had both of them do these commercials that talked about their dreams in terms of becoming the world's biggest hip hop artist or the world's mm. biggest designer. And they were like manifesting that in real time on camera. <laughs> it's an honor having a big time rapper coming in here. Rapper, rapper, rapper. Generation defining artist, maybe. Five tracks nominated. I'm going to be the most iconic designer of all time. The line for my stuff is going to go for miles. And tickets to my show, so hot. I'm going to be on the cover of every issue of every magazine in every country. Even the ones on Mars. So let's go. I got places to be. So it was really, really great to have them talk about all the things that they wanted to do and all the dreams they wanted to fulfill in their specific passion points. And then we were able to not only create that spot, but then we actually, it aired during the BET Awards, then we filmed it, and then we had them in the audience. It's crazy. And so we yeah. like cut out of the commercial, we're going directly to, here's Seth, here's Cody in the audience, right? So like that direct correlation, like yeah. these are real people, guys. Yeah. Like, 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 yeah. like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like this isn't, these are not story. actors, yeah. you know what I yeah. mean? And so that was the first piece and it was and i'll be honest with you the thing that really resonated with me the most was being able to go on their instagram pages mm. and see their friends see the mm. spot for the yeah. first time so like seth like i went to morehouse seth is at clark Atlanta. he's got all his friends just like posting about and talking about oh, oh that's crazy. my man seth yeah. like, oh. and i'm like that's the stuff that gets me like low-key emotional because you yeah. see that the thing that we do matters that much and when you can have real impact on someone's life like that it's just there's nothing like it yeah and so it was amazing to be able to do that so that was like the first step we took and then after that um you know we took a break for about a year couldn't typically we do like like one or two things annual with sprite and next year was pandemic so mm -hmm. during the pandemic one of the things that did happen and this is like right around the time of like brianna taylor and george floyd um, they, uh, Sprite as a brand was doing a thing where they were actually partnering with Black Lives Matter. And so they'd done a big donation with them and they wanted to kind of create a spot that really talked about the partnership and kind of announcing it to the world. And I think for us, again, going back to dreams, we wanted to use that as kind of like the centering point for the work that we wanted to put out into the world, right? Yeah. And the interesting thing when you think about dreams and you think about African-American experience is that the American dream in many ways is left behind black America. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to focus on that as like yeah. the thing that we wanted to bring to life in this piece. It wasn't just about like, here's Sprite with a partnership with Black Lives Matter and yeah. like everyone be happy about it. It's like, this is an opportunity for real storytelling and doing it in a way that again, is gonna resonate with this audience. Mm -hmm. So we created the spot. Um, we used a whole bunch of uh, photographers that were actually like from the Atlanta area that we used to source all the imagery in the spot. So again, one of the biggest things about this is always like giving black creators opportunity to like put them on, provide them mm -hmm. opportunities. So it started with Cody and Seth. Now it's a list of different photographers like from the Atlanta area. And that was it's always ongoing. the thing that continued to, to drive us. You yeah, know, for sure. Forward. The American dream. 
It wasn't made for everybody. It forgot about one very important detail. Black America. It's why this land of equal opportunity was built on the backs and genius of black people. And while black success isn't always a story of accomplishment, but a story of getting out. But black Americans woke up a long time ago and set out to make their own dream. They had to. We've seen it in Atlanta, the city we call home, and communities all around America. Black dreams matter. Black voices matter. Black lives matter. Black America's dream is the real American dream because it means everyone has a chance to succeed. And what would be your advice for other brands to follow suit? You know, because especially in strategy, you know, you put together this great like train of thought, right? And then the creative team gets really excited about it. And now it's this beautiful anthemic film, you know, yeah. it's, it's at all the award shows. Yeah. It's, it's winning everything. You know yeah. what I mean? But like it stops there and sometimes it stops there. Like you could even have a whole plan as far as like, how do we extend this into real life? But like because yeah. of budget concerns, like it has to stop there. And it's like, well, maybe we'll pick it back up next year and it doesn't get picked up. Right. So then the work that is put out into culture, it doesn't have such a, a deepening effect with the people who are actually watching it because it was just it's not real life. It's like yeah, TV. It's yeah, a TV yeah. spot, you know? But what I loved so much about this campaign was that like you were able to see the TV spot and be like, yo, I love these people like manifesting and, and talking about their dreams. But then you were actually able to see the brand help their dreams come true. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So what would be your advice, whether that's like strategists giving presentations on like how to extend a campaign into like a 360 aspect and across so many different, you know, channels, et cetera, or just for clients in general on understanding the importance of pushing your work beyond TV yeah. or an anthem. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing, and it kind of goes back to the point we we're talking about earlier is like audience impact, right? So at this stage, the consumer is incredibly savvy, right? Like they can smell BS like a mile away. Yeah. And so making a commercial or making an asset that like speaks to them is literally only the like the tip of the spear. You know, it's really just about what are the actions? What are going to be the things that you do to actually provide value? And that's where you start to see that level of, you know, sentiment, that level of like engagement with the brand, the brand love starts to grow because they're not just talking about it, they're being about it. And mm -hmm. so that I think is one of the most important things that I think it's also just easier to do if I'm being totally honest, where like, it's you have a marketing department where it can become much easier to just be able to like make commercials all day. But in reality, the things that really have impact in the real world require cross department collaboration yeah. and it's hard. Yeah. And I think we just have to acknowledge that like it's hard, it's very difficult to do, but it's always worth it in the end because if you want to move the needle, these are the things that you have to do to be able to do so. Yeah. And when you talk about cross-department collaboration within your career, have you majored in like brand strategy or like also touched like engagement and social, et cetera? Yeah. 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 So my experience is actually, I've had probably four different jobs um, since I've been in there. So I talked before about, I was in this associates program. I was rotating yeah. through consulting, brand strategy, entertainment, account management. I left that, went to translation, worked in account management left the account management department, went into what was known as our music department. Mm -hmm. Then I was doing that experiential production and that music yeah. partnership strategy, right? Yeah. And then went into brand strategy proper after that. So yeah. in terms of areas of the business, like I've had some level of experience in the majority of them. And it actually has really rounded me out very mm -hmm. well in terms of like the suggestions or the things that I provide that I'm always thinking about it through the perspective of like, okay, I understand dollars and cents. I understand client relationships. I understand high level mm. strategy. I understand the business aspect of it. I, to a certain degree, understand what it's gonna take to produce it. Mm. So like, that's not lost on me. And I also, you know, outside of work, I'm a DJ and I do events. Yeah. So like, I have to use those skills in that too. And like marketing and promoing yeah. events, how we're gonna produce it, who's gonna get, like all those sorts of things. Yeah. So, I very, very much operate as like a multi-hyphenate, but I think it's necessary in mm. order to be able to produce things at the level that they need to be done. Yeah, it's so important to be able to understand how all those different aspects work, like yeah. no matter what role you're in. 
but for more traditional strategists who are kind of like placed in a brand strategy role and for agencies that kind of place them in that role yeah. and they're like, this is your job, like please do your job <laughs> type thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, what would be your advice on getting that experience or understanding the full business versus like being boxed into just putting together mm. a brief and briefing in a creative team and your job being done, yeah. you know, cause strategy is not always brought through to the other conversations for production. You yeah. know, sometimes it really does stop with creative. Yeah. So how do you get that experience? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, I think, and I hope this answers the question. I remember some of the best advice that I got was, um, when I was working over at Wyden and Kennedy and I had a boss who basically told me, he's like, if you wanna have value as a strategy director here, you basically have to be the third creative director. And I remember when he told me that, I was like, but that's not my job. The moment that I felt investment and ownership over the idea is when I saw my trajectory start to change mm. because you have to, of course, you're coming up with the insight, you're coming up with the overall approach, you're bringing that brief to like, like you mentioned before, you're trying to inspire yeah. people. But then once it comes to the work, all that level of strategy that went into the idea, like it is your responsibility to ensure that that stays ingrained, mm. like as you move through the process, because it's only takes two meetings for like everything to get off track. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, just, I know. It's, just, it's like, it's like <laughs> just two, one. It's like, it could be one meeting yeah. and you're like, oh, and oh, sorry, I left you off the invite. Yeah. And then you look and you're like, what happened yeah. here? You know? Yeah. Um, but being able to like be that consistent force through every step of the process, I think is incredibly important. And mm. so I would just say, I guess my piece of advice is like, feel ownership over the idea. And that can mean, partnering very closely with the creative teams. That mm -hmm. can mean like from a production standpoint, you hear something in a meeting about like a way that the idea could approach differently, ha leaning in, having conversations there, yeah. partnering with your account people to say, oh, these are the challenges we're having with the client to sell it through, invest, yeah. like, partner with them there. But like, remember it's you're in the idea. Yeah. And so it's not just gonna come to life through strategy, there's gonna be account hurdles, there's gonna be production hurdles, there's gonna be creative hurdles, and like feel a sense of ownership and responsibility and just lean in where you can because even if people don't ask for that help, they always appreciate yeah. it. So yeah. like that's usually one of my biggest pieces of advice. And when you're talking about like ownership of the idea, like feeling as though you have ownership of the idea and more specifically partnering with creative in that yeah. role, sometimes <laughs> it can feel like very sticky ground. You know what I yeah. mean? Because you do have ownership of, over the idea and your job is to make sure that like your idea is fully communicated in the creative, mm -hmm. but creatives are creative. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And yeah. sometimes it feels like you're stepping on toes a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So how do you just within your own career, like manage that, like making sure that everything's staying on par with the brief, but also allowing creatives to just roam and like, yeah. be free. like what's the balance? You yeah. Know? Um, I, I came up with this thing a while back that I talked about, which is freedom within a framework, right? So like, it's just like a, a great athlete, great basketball coach does, mm -hmm. right? So like every team has offensive schemes, like Phil Jackson had the triangle, right? Yeah. And so he said, here's a triangle, here's a system, this is where you line up, but this only works with your creativity that you bring to the system. Mm. So you have to create the actual framework and then let people roam. Like you can't tell Michael Jordan like where to dribble and like yeah. where to bounce the, you know what I mean? Yeah, like you can't yeah. tell him that, but you could say, hey, could you line up over here? And then like, <laughs> and like didn't you can just do your thing. Yeah. And so it's, yeah. a, it's the same thing I think when it comes to like strategy and working with creative is like giving them like a little bit of the box and the details of like, as long as you guys are coming up with things that are like within this space, we're working in the right territory, how it manifests, how it comes to life, that's not really in my hands. And yeah. so I just always think about like, what's a framework I can create that's not gonna let things slip away from the original strategic intent, mm -hmm. but then allows people kind of like the room to play. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of, it's like a constant balancing. Yeah, the it's an map. art, yeah, yeah, for sure.
Coming back to the Sprite campaign, yeah. you know, we've talked about the brand and its role in culture. We've talked about the strategic process that you went down to lead a creative team to the idea. We've also talked about the idea itself and like how it manifested across culture, but kind of what were the results from it? Like how did people react across the industry or just the consumers yeah. that you were targeting? Yeah, I mean, it had amazing, amazing results in terms of the level of engagement. And one of the things I didn't mention previously is that we created the Sprite's like very first voting campaign. Mm. And then the same sort of like sentiment of, we asked people the reason why they were voting in the 2020 election, one of the biggest elections that we all know. Yeah. And they actually created pieces based off their reason for voting. Mm -hmm. And so we used those pieces and then connected them with like different sort of influencers and creators in different industries, right? So it's like someone had their reason for a vote, they used it to design a jacket, two chains wore it at a show. We mm -hmm. had other people who took photographs around the reason that they voted, this woman, Dorothy and then Rhapsody had it in her music video. So mm. we were trying to create, again, these opportunities to put the audience on, and it was super cool to kind of see how we got that level of engagement and again, yeah. what it meant to them. And then beyond that, the brand actually sold a ton of soda. Like sales <laughs> went up drastically, and that's yeah. an important thing too, where I think we always think that the work that we're doing around like brand building or like doing things of that nature mm. is just like solely for the purpose of brand building or reaching audience. But in this case, we were able to see a significant lift in sales during the period that we were doing the campaign mm. as well. Yeah. And so it was just being able to combine like art and commerce, mm. you know, and like putting those two things together was, was incredible for us. Yeah. And as the art piece, as far as like why it worked to actually drive sales, because you were actually able to connect with, not connect with consumers, but create something that they saw themselves in yeah. versus just the brand speaking to them as like the brand, you know? I think because one of the things that you'll find is that like, then there's always product driven marketing. So it's like, let's just talk about the product and then we're going to talk about the product and then we're going to hope that people want to buy product because mm. what we just told them. Personally, I don't feel that really works because people know what the product is to a certain degree. And so it's a matter of, how can you build an emotional connection to the brand and to the product? And yeah. in this moment, we knew that young African-American audience was like one of the biggest consumer groups for the brand. So if we reach them, then it's also an opportunity to directly lead to sales because they buy the yeah. product at an incredibly high clip. Now, for morality's sake, we wanted to do that in a way that like talked to them in a clear way. It wasn't just like pushing soda to them, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we were able to do it in a way that really deeply connected with the audience and also providing them opportunity and helping them see themselves in yeah. the brand. I love the campaign. It was Thank so you. good. Thank you. It was you. so good. And you've dropped so many great gems throughout this conversation. Thank you. But what are like one or two key takeaways that you would want to leave our audience with? Yeah, um, I would say the first thing related to a point I made before, it's like creating actions and not just ads and like continuing to push the client, like even when it's tough, even when it's going to require like a heavy lift, yeah, we have to do things that actually pay off the value proposition in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the most important things when you're coming up with campaigns is not stopping at the spot, but saying using that as essentially the jumping off point to all the different things that you can create. Right. Yeah. So I think that's incredibly important. And another point, as I mentioned before, it's like, tell the truth, tell it with a slant. Like that's one of the, yeah. my biggest sort of like principles, like yeah. as it relates to strategy, because I think in many cases, we're telling people the thing that they already innately know, but we're doing it in an interesting, in a provocative way. And lastly, it's like, have the courage to tell the truth. Um, and I think a lot of times where you wanna kind of create the avenue that's gonna be the path of least resistance or mm -hmm. just tell it to people straight. And like when we're creating work, we're advertising, we're marketing, we're trying to be persuasive. But you have you seen in any great film, any great album that you love, it always has an element of truth to it. Yeah. And like when you think about things like comedians are the greatest truth tellers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because they're telling you the thing that like you already know, but then they're finding this like weird and funny angle into telling you the thing that you innately know to be true. Yeah. So don't be afraid to tell the truth. You can still do it in a creative way. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that I think is really important as How well. How do you get good at that though? 
how do you get good at it feels like wordplay you know what i mean like Like telling the truth but telling it in a way that no one's ever heard before yeah you know all of that's like language and words like how do you develop that even stronger yeah i think it's you know in in my experience i really just like look at the thing that everybody's looking at but try to look at it from a different angle right so i'm always trying to find like the nuance underneath it and so sometimes that can lead to something that's very like powerful where like the work that we did with sprite it's like oh this culture like i could have just told you the insight is hip-hop affects every asset of culture yeah aspect of culture right yeah and then that would have been it and they would have been like there's no inspiration behind that but be like hip-hop represents a culture that represents endless possibilities now you're inspired by that it's the same thing i told you the exact same information but it's a matter of figuring out how do I get this to a point where it feels motivational and inspirational to the audience? Yeah. And it can be the same things with jokes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Where people are talking about things that everybody knows about. And then you're like, but did you ever think about it this way? Yeah. And it's like, that's yeah. what the, you know, the Dave Chappelle's, Jerry Seinfeld, like all of them find a way to do that. Yeah. And that's what makes them so great. So it is a bit of an art form, but I would always encourage people to like, look beyond the surface level of how the information is being Mm. presented to you, interpret it in your own way. And if it makes you question things or it makes you think about it differently, you're kind of onto something. On the right track. You know what I mean? So always think about it from your perspective as well. Well, thank you. So many gems were dropped. And that is the end of The Invisible Thread. Thanks for watching and see you next time.